the Lord. This is Pastor Bill Emmons at um, Covenant Faith Center, CFC Ministries International. Uh, is Instagram family on already? Well, I better go ahead and turn that on so we can have them watching and listening as well. And I'm going to shut down my computer now where we get our music from. <laughs> Praise God. Good to have you with us for Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. And uh, by the way, oh, we need our lights on. And, and uh, boy, did I goof on that. <laughs> I'm going to ask Pastor Mary to uh, get the lights adjusted. It's um, we got to have this one moved out and put in proper position. And I was so busy doing all the other stuff that um, I didn't even pay attention to that. So we'll get this uh, adjusted here really quick. And uh, okay, now it looks like we've got... Um, there we go. All right, that balances out. All right, here I am. <laughs> Praise God. We had uh, our, our, our lights on, our studio lights off, and um, our overhead light on, and that's the worst light possible. So I have to get that always adjusted. Anyway, that's why God is giving us an assistant that's going to handle all this stuff. And I can just concentrate on my particular job, which is teaching and preaching and ministering the things of God. All right, so good to have you with us. Uh, I, I did want to mention that um, this is our Bible study. So if you don't like studying the Bible, then, <laughs> you know, just kind of stick around. I think it might, uh, you might learn something. It might, well, I know you're going to learn something. And uh, if you open up to it, I believe God will give you something to take home with you. Or if you're home, use it there. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Um, the only thing I'm going to ask you to do tonight, uh, other than pay attention and, and hopefully you got a notebook and, and your pen or pencil out in your Bible. Uh, I know a lot of people don't carry Bibles anymore, but it's not a bad thing to have a Bible. <clears throat> I've got two sitting right here. I, I got more than that, but we just packed up our uh, shelves over here and I'll give you a quick shot of that. You see they're empty. Uh, it's because we're moving in about two weeks. Uh, believe it or not, the weekend of, um, of, of um, what is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and God's going to make it go easy and it's going to work. And praise God, we're going to get it done, get moved into the, the house we're going into. But um, anyway, so I, in, that, in that shelf and usually behind me on the credenza, I have probably half a dozen or more different Bibles uh, but then I do use the electronic ones, the digital ones as well, because they are, in most cases, quicker. All right, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to click some buttons for me. Uh, click the like button. And uh, even if you're brand new, just click the like button. It'll help us. Uh, click the share button. And also share it not only to your group, but share it uh, to the public because you'll reach more people. Uh, share the follow button so that you become a follower of us. You follow our ministry. And uh, if you're on a, a social media platform that has a subscribe button, click the subscribe button. It's the same as the follow button, but um, that'll help. And you, it doesn't cost you nothing. You don't have to sign anything or, or commit to anything or, you know, just you're following. Uh, click the notification button so that you can be notified when we come on. Because we may surprise you and come on sometime in the middle of the week, in the, in the middle of the night, early morning. You never know. So the notification button will let you know. And then uh, last but not least, I'd like to ask you to leave us a comment, even if it's just to say hi or I'm watching or, you know, anything like that. Just be nice. If you don't like what I'm preaching or the way I'm dressed or the way I talk, uh, you know, that's, you deal with it. <laughs> but just be nice and but leave us a comment uh now if you got a testimony an answered prayer miracle healing whatever it might be we want to hear that so give us your testimony uh, but um as i've said many times the algorithms that run the social media platforms they respond to activity every time you click one of those buttons you're creating activity on our page and when you share it with a bunch of other people and suggest to them that they do the same thing, uh, that multiplies the activity. The more activity we get, which is, you know, responses to things, 
what happens is that the algorithms will begin to push our programming out to more people that we're not reaching right now. Right now, we're, we, we're actually hovering right around the 40,000 um, homes uh, or households mark or viewers mark. <clears throat> our goal right now is 50,000 uh, households or views per week. So, uh, you know, as you share it, you help us reach more people and that increases our ability to share the gospel with people that maybe have never heard it or teaching that they have not heard this way uh, or ministry by the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit and maybe they need to be born again or spirit filled or, you know, any number of things that God has provided for us. So do that and we can help and bless more people. Amen. All right, the title of tonight's uh, segment, and this is part six. Now, I have no idea when I started this particular series, we were going to go six sessions. And as, as I'm looking at it now, like it may go more. But this subject is a deep subject in the sense that for years, I would say 99% of the Christians in the world uh, did not know about this subject. Those that did, a lot of times, didn't identify it as a Christian thing. They identified it as a, a tribal thing, and that's called covenant or blood covenant. And uh, so when we get into particularly Western uh, Christianity, uh, most people didn't know it. I, I didn't start learning about the blood covenant until I was in my 20s, and I grew up in church, and I never heard it before. And yet we read the scriptures that we're going to read tonight uh, in um, uh, Genesis, where God speaks to uh, Abraham and calls him and, and makes a covenant with him. But it never carried meaning to me until I began to get revelation on what a blood covenant really is. It's the strongest form of agreement known to mankind. Uh, breaking it, the penalty for breaking it is death. And if your family won't do it, you know, the other family will. Uh, it's just that strong. Well, God came to Abraham and made a covenant. We're going to read that here in a minute. And uh, then after he made the promises to Abraham, what he was going to do for him and for his family, uh, he then swore by himself because, I mean, what's higher than God? Nothing. There's no being and there is no thing higher or above God. So he swore by himself, with, which means he put himself, his word, on the line. And if he ever broke his promise, then that would make him a liar because he said that he would not break his covenant. And he swore to uphold the promises. And uh, if he lied, then he would have to go under the authority of the father of liars, which is the devil. And you don't think God's going to let that happen, do you? <laughs> All right. So this is part six. And the title is simply Covenant Keeping God. And the series is called Covenant. Now, I've done a 12-part series called The Blood Covenant. We actually have put that into a, a format we've used uh, for our school of ministry. And we have a binder with all the notes and, and the DVDs or CDs where you can study that out and so forth. Uh, but this is a, a different version of that, not, not different in understanding, but just kind of looking at different things. What we're looking at is what covenant people do when people know they're in covenant and they're walking by faith in that covenant. How do they act? How do they live? How do they respond? And so that's really what we're looking at right now, as well as, you know, what God has to say and what God has done. So in Genesis 15, 1, uh, in fact, you can go back for reference, go back to Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. I think I made a clerical error there. Um, it's Genesis chapter 1, verses, mm, no. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I made an error there. Um, anyway, Genesis 15, 1. All right, Genesis 15, 1. You know, you get typing notes, and I don't know about you, but sometimes my fingers are kind of big, and they hit the wrong buttons. And then when I proofread my notes, I think I've got it all corrected. Sometimes I miss it. 
So Genesis 15, 1 from the King James translation. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, if you want to know what those statements mean, go back to last uh, Tuesday night's Bible study, because I talked about that in more detail. But God is saying that he is going to be Abraham's covenant partner. And by being a covenant partner, he says, I am, I am God, the I am that's used there. He says, and the I am is your shield. In other words, God protects his covenant people <clears throat> and thy exceeding great reward. God is the reward of your act of faith in walking in covenant with God. And we talked about that last week. All right, but there was also a prophetic aspect of God's uh, talking to Abram or Abraham eventually uh, when his name was changed. There's a prophetic aspect of it. And you go to Genesis 15 again, verses three through six. Abram said, behold, uh, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. This is God talking. This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He, uh, and he brought uh, him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. Now I love this. It says that Abraham believed God. He didn't just believe in God. He believed that what God said, God would do. That's where a lot of us today in uh, our faith, we're lacking because we really don't believe that everything God says he will do. Uh, when the Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, a lot of times we don't really believe God's going to supply all of our need. When we hear the, the scripture read, uh, Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us. The curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree so that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles or us. We read things like that, and yet we don't really believe that that's for us or that, that God is going to do that for us. When the Bible says, uh, delight yourself greatly in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. There's a lot of Christians that just can't bring themselves to believe that. God's going to give me the desires of my heart. Don't you know man's desires are wicked? No, no. There's desires God will put in your heart. Things that he wants you to accomplish. Things he wants to bless you with. And uh, But if we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, we can trust God to give us the desires of our hearts. But a lot of Christians don't believe that. Well, here it says that uh, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. In other words, that faith was enough to give standing with God, to give Abraham standing with God. He had a right to come to God and, and pray and ask for help and, and provision, whatever he might need, and had the right to expect that because they're in covenant. Everything the two parties have, they've given to each other. Whatever God has, Abraham had a right to ask for that. Amen. All right. Um, a prophetic word in this whole thing we're going to talk about here um, in Genesis 15, verse 13. Uh, and he said unto Abram, God said to Abram, Know the surety that thy seed, in other words, your offsprings, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now, God is speaking prophetically about Abraham's offspring. Uh, when we look at Abraham, we, we tend to think only in terms of Abraham and Sarah and what God was saying and what God was uh, doing through them, for them, with them. Uh, but God is speaking now beyond Abraham. He's talking to him about his children. All right. And 
when we get down to verse 14, he says, and also <clears throat> that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. Now, let me, let me make a statement here before, because when we read on, we're going to read about another number of years and you need to understand what was going on. When God spoke here, he said that they shall, the country they're going to, which by the way was Egypt, it says they shall afflict them, your, your uh, family, your heirs, 400 years. There was a point in time when uh, they were not afflicted by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh. There was a point in time where they were blessed and they were welcomed and they were a blessing to Egypt. In fact, uh, <laughs> they, they, they kept uh, the Egyptians from starving to death because of the great famine there was in the earth. And so, uh, so there was 400 years uh, that they were afflicted, but we're gonna see another number and you need to understand the difference was the time when they were welcomed before they were unwelcomed and they became slaves eventually. All right. so. Um, verse 15, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Four generations. Well, if you're looking at 400 plus years in this event that we're talking about, uh, and then you begin to read about how long people lived in those days. Uh, you can see that a generation was about 100 years. Now, a generation is not how long each generation lived. It had more to do with uh, when a new generation came up. Now, in some cases, and Pastor Mary and I were talking about this earlier today, in some cases, you know, people did have children younger, but in a lot of them, you read and find out that they didn't have any children until they were over 100 years old. So they, I, I'm assuming that the average age uh, of the parents uh, before the next generation was born was about 100 years old. Now, I could be a little bit off on that, but that's, you know, what I see and, and uh, prove me wrong, <laughs> you know. But it says right there, uh, four generations. Well, he mentioned 400 years. And then he mentions four generations. All right, so verse 16, in the fourth generation, they, his offspring, shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Let's go to verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, which is what? what what's the river? Uh, of, it's the Nile, right? You got the Blue Nile and the White Nile that are further north and they come together. And, uh, you know, if you assume that where they came together and became the Nile, uh, that that would be uh, the point at which um, it, you could say that that's the land God is giving them. But, uh, you know, some people might say, well, there's, in, in the map I've got here in front of me, uh, there's a border between Egypt and Sudan. And maybe it was that border, which, by the way, Sudan was another nation back then. And uh, so even at that, but let me show you this map and see if you can uh, see this clearly enough. I'm going to hold it up for a second. And um, I'm waiting for my monitor to show me I'm holding it. All right, the yellow there, uh, is uh, Saudi Arabia. It's the, it's all that land of the Middle East that we tend to talk about. And then you've got Iraq. Let's see, where am I? Up here, you got uh, Iraq, which is, I, there's a delay in my monitor. So as I'm looking, I'm looking to see, okay, uh, you got Iraq and you got Iran. And uh, of course you got Saudi Arabia and a bunch of smaller countries here. But you see the black line I've drawn on here. All right, if you take it straight from up here down to here, that's where the Nile comes into existence as the Nile, from the White Nile and the Blue Nile. And then up here, it's where the Euphrates dumps out. And that's what God told him. 
And if you go on a modern map, you see how many countries are in that property, that land that God gave to Abraham and his descendants. Now it goes on and says, um, I have, I have given this land. Now this is back around 1300 BC. That's a long time ago. <laughs> That's before any of these countries even existed. All there were were tribes and they were roaming tribes. There were nomad tribes. So God is saying, I'm going to give uh, Israel and, and Abraham, I'm going to give you your own land and you won't have to move anymore. Um, it's a place where you're going to be able to dwell forever. And what's really interesting is that all they've got right now is a small strip of land up in here. That's all they're inhabiting right now. And yet all these countries around them, you got Jordan, you got Syria, uh, you, you got, well, obviously the Gaza Strip uh, where Hamas has been hiding. Uh, but, uh, and of course, Saudi Arabia is there. If they inhabited all the land that God gave them today, they would probably be the largest country land mass or land wise in the world. Well, when you read what he says here, you can see how that's possible. It goes on and says, I've given this land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, uh, to the river Euphrates. So at least we have two, you know, we have an east-west boundary, all right? And then he said in, in um, verse 19, he mentions tribes, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaims, which were the Nephilim, by the way, the Amorites and the Canaanites, the Girgashites and the Jebusites. So if, if we had a map now of where those tribes were back 1300 BC, we could then identify uh, more clearly uh, the different areas that they were going to inhabit and the tribes that would eventually be driven out. Because these tribes, if I can say it this way, they were godless tribes. They didn't worship God. They worshiped false gods. They worshiped demons. Uh, in Egypt, uh, they, they worshiped just an, uh, probably not as many as Hinduism worships, but they worshiped a lot of false gods. A lot of them were nothing more than demons. In fact, a false god is backed by a demon. And so when we get into the Egypt part of it again, I'm going to share at least two or three of those with you tonight if I don't run out of time. Okay, so then in Genesis 17, God reiterates or repeats uh, his covenant promises to Abraham when he was 99 years old. Uh, you say, well, uh, 99, he can't have kids at 99. Well, it says that uh, Sarah was about 90 years old and she was able to conceive and between them, they, they bear children. And, uh, you know, when you start reading this, you, you think, wow, how can somebody at 99 or 100 years old bear any children? Well, lifespan was different back then. Uh, people lived longer. They worked hard. They lived hard. Uh, and, of course, with God, all things are possible. So when God says it, you can bank on it. All right, so in Genesis 17 now, uh, when Abram was 99 years old, 90 and 9 years old, the Lord appeared uh, to Abram and said to him, I am, there's the I am again. And he says, the, not a, not an, not a God or an, an God. <laughs> I am the almighty. The almighty means there ain't nobody more powerful. Almighty God, walk before me. Be thou perfect. Being perfect doesn't mean he's a perfect person and never makes a mistake. Being perfect had to do with covenant. In other words, keep my covenant agreement and you'll be perfect in my sight. Because he was doing his best to obey God when he would do that. So, and, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, God is saying, as far as I'm concerned, because he's already spoken to him about the covenant. He says, as for me, behold, or look and see, my covenant is with thee. He's saying, it's already done. I've already decided. 
because he knew the faith of Abraham. So he made a commitment already before he even got Abraham involved in the conversation. As for me, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father to many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. See, he's talking past tense, as if it's already happened. Well, God, the Bible declares, speaks of things that be not as though they were. He sees the end from the beginning. When God sets out to do something, he already knows where it's going. He already knows what the end result's going to be. When the Bible tells us to copy God's example, that's, that's one of the principles of faith, is you need to meditate on God's promises until you can see where you're supposed to go with your faith and what you're supposed to do uh, and believe God for. And then you envision the promises of God fulfilling that vision in your heart. And, and you write it down. You keep it where you can see it. You begin to talk about it. You declare it. You agree with God, what he says. What God promises, you can, you can uh, declare it over yourself. All right, so, neither shall the name any more be Abram, but Abraham for a father of many nations. Have I made thee? Yet he's not even had Isaac yet. <laughs> All right, verse six. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now, we know that if you just stick with the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, the 12 tribes all became nations. Uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, things like, uh, for example, uh, we talk about uh, the sons of Noah, the three sons of Noah. And uh, those three sons went out and established uh, not necessarily what we might today call nations, but territories with people that took on an, an aspect of the, I'm not sure nature is, is right, the nature of the father, uh, but some of his characteristics and ways of thinking and doing. And we have those three groupings of people going to the earth. Well, with Abraham now, he's, he's got 12 tribes that, that become nations. People talk about, oh, you know, the Jews today, you know, there's only one tribe. Well, no. The Jews are made up of Judah and Benjamin. The Jews we, you know, hear on the news right now uh, in Israel, they're made up of Judah and Benjamin. Uh, the, uh, that's the, the true Judaism, or Judah, Jew, uh, comes from that. Uh, of course, then there's still 10 tribes that they say are lost tribes. I got news for you. They're not lost. God knows exactly where they are. Now, over the, my lifetime, we have discovered where some of them are. We know where the tribe of Dan went. We know where um, some of Isaac's relatives went. Uh, Saxon, the word Saxon, uh, means Isaac's sons. Uh, Dan, the tribe of Dan, Denmark, the mark of Dan, that's what that means. And God said everywhere Dan goes, he'll leave his mark. Well, uh, the Vikings, uh, the Celts, uh, tribes that, that explored the world. And I mean, the, the earliest um, white European, uh, I guess you can call them European if they're Vikings. Uh, anyway, the, the first white settlers that came here that we have any record of are the Vikings. And that was way before Christopher Columbus or anybody else came. Uh, and I'm not, getting, I'm not getting into a lot of detail on that. But what I'm saying is we know where some of the tribes are. Uh, we may not yet recognize all 12, but we're getting more and more knowledge of who they are and where they went. Um, let's continue with this. All right, so uh, he said, um, what, what verse was I in? Uh, verse six, mm -hmm. kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. God didn't just say it's between you and me. He says between you and me and your seed, your offspring. Now, I, I know, for example, I know some of my heritage. I've got uh, some English heritage. I've got a lot of Irish heritage. My dad was full-blooded Irish. His, his parents came here from Ireland, both of them Irish. 
so I know I've got a lot of Irish blood in me. I know there's some uh, Viking uh, blood from Norway. Uh, I, I've never had a DNA test. I'm curious to find out what all it sees. But I also know that my grandfather on my mother's side was a uh, full-blooded Cherokee Indian, American Indian, or you call them Native Americans, whatever you want to say. But I know that I've got that as well. So I know some of my heritage, and I can, and, and actually there's some people that have traced uh, some of the tribes uh, into uh, some of the Native Americans. So there's, there's a lot that we're learning, a lot that we haven't yet had our eyes open to, the bottom line is the tribes, 10 tribes did not disappear. They were dispersed, but they didn't disappear. And when we get to the tribulation period, which it feels like we're getting pretty close, of course, there's going to be the rapture of the church take place before that all breaks loose. Uh, but in the tribulation period, the Bible says that they're all tribes will be gathered together, talking about the tribes uh, from Abraham, the 12 tribes. They'll be gathered together in Israel, and from that gathering, there is going to come uh, evangelists that will go throughout the world and preach uh, the gospel, even though they um, may be Jewish or, you know, some other come from a different area, that there are going to be 12,000 evangelists from each tribe, for each of the 12 tribes. That's 144,000 evangelists are going to have one job, to go into the humans that are left in this world and preach the gospel to them. And, uh, and that may continue with them even into the millennial reign. And I say that because not everybody's going to die in the tribulation. There's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to step over into the thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth. And it may be those will be the main evangelists traveling the world, preaching the gospel to New generations. I mean, how many generations are going to be born in a thousand years? Because humans uh, that don't have their glorified bodies, uh, you know, coming through the tribulation, they're going to be able to have children. And so how many generations are there going to be in a thousand years? We can barely keep track of three or four generations. And yet you're talking, you know, a thousand years here. All right. So uh, let's move on. I will establish my covenant between me and thy seed after their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed. And it's not just the Jews. Remember all 12 tribes. God said he will be a God to covenant people. He will be God to them. The I am. Not a God, but God. So really, and I like what it says in the New Testament where it says uh, is not the children of Abraham that are the true heirs of the promises, but it's those that they are the offspring of the faith of Abraham. That's us. Whether I'm one of the 12 tribe descendants or not, I'm of the faith of Abraham. If you believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you make Jesus Lord and you live for the Lord uh, um, and you walk by faith, what happens is you inherit the promises that God gave to Abraham and his descendants. You become grafted in, the Bible says, and you now are, are legally one of the descendants of Abraham. So no matter if I'm the descendant of one of the tribes or not, I'm still an heir of Abraham. I'm an heir of the covenant of promise, which is Jesus, the Messiah. And I've made him Lord of my life. So now I'm born again. And I have not only the benefits of the blessings of Abraham, according to Galatians 3.13, but I have the benefits of Jesus and the work that he did. Forgiveness of sins, you know, eternal life fellowship with the Father, the authority and dominion given to man, the name of Jesus, that at that name, at the use of that name, every knee must bow in heaven and earth, beneath the earth. So we have a lot, a lot that God has made provision for us and to give thanks for. Amen. All right, so in verse 8 again, I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee the land, which we already talked about that, that thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting, an everlasting possession, not just for 50 years or 75 years or 100 years, but from Abraham till now. It belonged to Israel then, 
from 1300 BC to 2024. All that land from the Nile to the Euphrates and most of Saudi Arabia and uh, Iraq and, um, you know, you, you go along and some of the other nations, Jordan, Syria, and so forth, uh, that land belongs to Israel. Uh, you, can don't, you don't have to like that. You don't have to agree with it, but that's what God said. And what God said comes to pass. And we're going to see that here in a moment. Let me see how much time I've got. Oh, I'm doing a lot of talking and run out of time. All right, I want you to go 400 years down the road, which we're looking at roughly 900 BC. Israel comes out of Egypt exactly as God said. Exodus chapter two. So I want you to see two things. God keeps his word. He keeps his promises. And a covenant person will be a person who lives based on those promises, walks in the faith of Abraham, where he believed God. God said something to him, and it says he believed God. <laughs> well, God said something to me, and I believe God, so I'm walking in the blessings. Praise God. All right. Exodus 2, verse 23, it came to pass in the process of time, which was 400 years down the road, just as God had said that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up uh, unto God by reason of the bondage. Verse 24, and God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, let me correct something here. God didn't forget. <laughs> when it says God remembered, it doesn't mean he forgot and just now remembered. It means God turned his attention to his promises made to Abraham. That's what's going on here. All right. God heard their groanings. God remembered or turned his attention toward Israel uh, and his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 25, and God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. Why? Because they were covenant partners. They were his covenant people. Now, chapter three, verse one, King James translation. Now we're in Exodus chapter three. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the, bur of the bush, the fiery bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. He said, drawn, drawn not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am. Now again, the I am, you got to get that in there. When God says I am, he's saying, when, they, when uh, Moses said, God, who do I tell Israel uh, called me? Who, who do I tell them is talking to me about this? He said, tell them I am has sent you. That's what he's saying here. I'm the I am. And he said, I am the God, not a God. Again, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I came down, I am come down, to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, a large, unto a land of uh, flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. 
Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee, Moses, unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. All right, so God fulfills or starts the fulfillment of this promise uh, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Isaac, that's Isaac and Jacob together, right, Isaac? Anyway, um, now I want you to remember how long did God said they would be oppressed? He said 400 years. Now let's read chapter Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Well, I know there's people out there that will say, uh oh, there's a mistake. There's an error in the Bible. There is no error. This makes perfect sense. When you remember, they didn't go into Egypt as slaves. They, they were welcomed into Egypt. And uh, excuse me, I got an itch in my ear. <laughs> Sorry, I hate to do that on camera. But you know, when you got an itch. <laughs> anyway, they, went in, they were welcomed into Egypt. Pharaoh welcomed them. And so what we see is that there was 30 years where they walked in, if I can say it this way, uh, Pharaoh's blessing. And, but then they began to multiply and they began to outnumber the Egyptians and the, and the, uh, the Pharaohs uh, began to get nervous. And the people, the Egyptians began to get nervous and they're, they're talking, complaining, well, they're going to be more than us. And, and they might just want to, you know, take over Egypt, you know. Well, half Egypt belonged to them anyway, according to God. All right, so at the end of the, uh, it came to pass at the end of the 430 years. So what we see here is the period of time from the time they entered Egypt as what would have been a family with their servants, uh, and they multiplied, but there was 30 years of peace for, for Abraham's descendants in Egypt. 30 years where they were liked, 30 years where they were accepted and welcomed, and they were a blessing to Egypt. But then things changed, as does happen sometimes, and then we see 400 years of oppression. And we don't know that the actual slavery part happened early on, like, you know, 30 years down the road, but the oppression, the attitude begin to change. So we have a very clear understanding uh, according to the word, everything has to jive. And we have that clear understanding that there was a 30 years of peace and prosperity and, and then things changed. All right. So at the end of 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt, just as God had promised. Now, I want to just introduce the judgments, and I don't want to linger too much on the judgments, but I want you to see, because I told you, in Egypt, they worshiped many gods, and they were false gods. They didn't worship this God of Abraham, the God of creation. They did, for a while, have respect for this God of Abraham. Uh, and actually, God said, I'll make you, made Abraham, I'll make you a God to the Pharaoh and to Egypt. And I'll make your brother Aaron your prophet. That's kind of an interesting thing. But see, they never saw God. They didn't Egypt. They didn't know God. They had no relationship with God. They had no standing with God. And so when Moses comes along and begins to do things and proclaim things and miracles take place and so forth, uh, to them, that would have been like a God coming down. And that's what God was really saying. All right. So. Uh, the first miracle that we see uh, is when, and I, I actually forgot to write down the reference. Obviously, it's in Exodus in chapter 7. But um, Aaron's rod becomes a serpent. Now, the magicians who did have magical demonic powers were able to do things too. And so Aaron just had a rod. Well, and I don't know, I, I've read things that says that they could uh, petrify a snake, that the magicians could, and that any time they wanted, they could turn it back into a serpent and it would crawl away. 
I don't know if that's true or not, but they were able to do some things that were, you know, like awe inspired. Inspired, excuse me. All right. So Aaron's run. What what is happening is Pharaoh is challenging uh, Moses, the just one of the descendants of Abraham. He's challenging him, and he's challenging his God, because in Egypt we got a lot of gods, and you only have one God. Well, who's that? You know. So he uh, throws his rod down. Uh, it becomes a serpent. The wise men, which were magicians and sorcerers in Egypt, they threw their rods down and they turned to serpents. But here's the thing. This is the prophecy part of this miracle is the rod that Abraham threw down, swallowed up the other rods, swallowed up the snakes, which is really interesting. Now, in um, they, they, let me read my notes here. Um, the knowledge of faith in the covenant-keeping God of Israel would swallow up the false religions of Egypt. The world's, at, represents the world's religions outside of Christianity and Judaism. All right. The second miracle was in Exodus chapter 7, verse 19. A judgment against Egypt's gods, uh, or God, knew in you uh, of the goddess of the Nile or waters where Egypt sacrificed their male children to, God told Moses to take his rod and strike the waters of Egypt and they became blood. This wasn't just the Nile river. This was every, uh, stream, every, um, uh, tributary, uh, every pond, um, wherever there was water, it all turned, if it was water, in big jars, in Pharaoh's uh, house or whatever you want to call where he lived, palace, uh, all the water in Egypt turned to blood, except the water for the children of Israel. Now, that's interesting. How come they weren't affected? Because they're under God's protection. What was happening? God was judging the false god. The demon knew that the Egyptians worshiped and they then were becoming under the judgment of that demonic uh, spirit that God was putting judgment on. The third miracle is in Exodus chapter eight, verses two through four. And let me check. Okay. Uh, this was a judgment against uh, Egypt's uh, goddess Heki, H-E-K-I. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or not. Uh, it was depicted uh, with a frog head, a, a, a human body with a frog head. Have you seen these um, Egyptian uh, tablets or walls, uh, you know, where they built buildings and they had all these pictographs on the walls and, and you see uh, human bodies with different heads on them. Um, that's because they worship these things as gods. So they had a, uh, if I can say it this way, they had a frog god. <laughs> Why would we worship a frog god? Well, Heki, or Hiki, I don't know again the right pronunciation, her job supposedly as a goddess of Egypt was to keep the frog population down and keep them from, uh, because they lived, they had water all around them there in Egypt. And of course, the Nile would flood periodically every year. And uh, there was a lot of frogs. So they worshiped this, this demon, false goddess, uh, whose job was to keep the population of the frogs down. So here's a judgment on Heki. Um, and uh, it was a judgment against Pharaoh and the Egyptians as well for worshiping a false god. When the Jews had been in Israel for 430 years, worshiping their god one God. And I'm sure Pharaoh mocked them because they had dozens of gods. And yet the one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the God that sustained Israel, was the God that prospered them, was the God that blessed them, was the God that uh, gave um, uh, one of their um, uh, fathers when they went into Egypt, the wisdom to uh, protect them and feed them during the famine. Uh, I mean, you know, the Pharaohs saw a lot of miracles uh, with the Jews. 
and yet they wouldn't they wouldn't yield to that. They would have respect for a short time, and we read that in these uh, writings here. They would uh, Pharaoh would respect for a short time, but very short. He would always revert back to his false gods. All right, so we just read the first three miracles: uh, Aaron's rod that um, that turned into a serpent, swallowed up the magician's rods that became snakes. The second one was a judgment uh, on the waters. Uh, and, and what's interesting is when Pharaoh finally repented and asked uh, Moses to seek his God to deliver them from these plagues, it would be instant. The water would just clear up. The frogs would just go away. Very interesting. Third miracle again was a plague of frogs. So next week, uh, what we're going to do is go through the other miracles and take you a step further in the study of covenant men. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all covenant men. Uh, of course, we, we get uh, uh, the, the sons of Isaac. They were all covenant men, uh, the 12 sons. And uh, then you've got Moses, obviously, was a covenant man. He believed God. Abraham, he, he got that from Abraham. And he uh, did what he did because of his faith in God and God's promises to deliver Israel because they had the word. They had the prophetic word already. They already knew it was time to go. <laughs> and they did. They ended up leaving Egypt just as God had promised. Amen. All right. Well, I know I'm leaving you hanging here, but you know, you want to go back and read it for yourself. That's okay. Go back and start at chapter uh uh, Genesis chapter 17, and uh, let's see. No, I'm sorry, Exodus. I looked at the wrong page of my notes. Uh, Exodus chapter 8, and you can read from there about the other plagues. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But I, I then want to move on to more covenant men and show you uh, what you can be if you will decide to walk in God's covenant promises. The promises of Abraham belong to us, and we can walk in them. Remember Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us. Why? So that the blessings of Abraham would come upon us. If you don't know what that is, go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, read verses 1 through 14, and you'll see a pretty good explanation of what the blessings of Abraham are. And they belong to you as a believer. Now, if you're not a believer, you say, well, I don't, I don't understand. How, how do you, what do you mean this believer? How do you, well, you need to be born again. Jesus only had one qualification to enter into heaven. He said, you must be born again. He didn't say you got, didn't say, you know, the way you get to heaven is being good. He didn't say the way to heaven is giving, giving uh, your tithe. He didn't say the way to heaven is giving, making sacrifices. He said the way to heaven is to be born again. So the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you will believe, in other words, it's your will to choose to believe or to not believe. We've got 6,000 years of biblical history. It's not just a story. It's the history of God's dealing with man and the covenant, old covenant, new covenant. He said, if you will choose to believe that, and then we've got the testimony of millions of Christians around us. There's Christians around you, wherever you are, whatever country you're in, there's Christians around you. You can find them, even if it's against the law to be a Christian and worship God, you'll find them. They're there. What, what do we do? We have to decide. They must be right. If the, They must know something. If they worship one God, and it's the God of creation, and he sent his own son to pay the price and suffer so we could be free, forgiven, and have eternal life. So make a decision. So if you will believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. How do you do that? Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. I receive the forgiveness that you provided for me, the cleansing from my sin. Jesus, come in and recreate me and bring the nature of God into me. And Almighty God, I come to you now as a child, your child, born again by the work of Jesus Christ. 
and I declare that Jesus is Lord of my life. Amen. It's, it's a simple prayer. You don't have to make it complicated. <laughs> Praise God. I want to know if you got born again because of this message today, why don't you just send me an email at w-e-m-m-o-n-s-0-1 at gmail.com and tell me, Pastor Bill, uh, I heard your message on, uh, you know, March 19th, 2024 on um, covenant keeping God. And I prayed that prayer and I got saved. I want to hear if, if any of you tonight, because see the anointing is on the word. When the anointing goes, when the word goes forth, the anointing goes forth and it says the anointing destroys the yoke. So during my teaching, people can be getting, getting healed, delivered, set free and, and uh, provision manifesting. So if any of you experience that through what you've heard in this ministry, I'd really love to hear from you and hear what God did for you after you heard what we've had to share with you. Amen. All right. Well, I'm out of time. I love you guys. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, check with us uh, Thursday afternoon. I don't have an exact time. It, it, it fluctuates. It's floating time. But uh, we'll be here Thursday afternoon at some time with a, just a word of exhortation to keep, give you a boost for the end of the week. Amen. We love you guys. I said it already, but I say it again. Appreciate you. And we will see you on Thursday.